Most of the time, the imagination of the developers is enough to create bizarre stories, eerie environments, and unsettling atmospheres that can make us uncomfortable and sense a feeling of fear and mystery. However, on some occasions, game creators don't actually need to unleash their wild imagination or even come up with any fictional story to scare us because the real world is simply capable of doing it on their behalf. Our planet is full of enigmatic stories that still, to this day, go beyond human logic and comprehension. The reason why real life horror is so powerful is because it's a haunting reminder that the world we inhabit is not always a place of safety and comfort. Or, to be accurate, it's not even a place that we fully understand. This type of horror confronts us with the stark realities of human evil, the destructive power of nature, and the unexplained mysteries that defy rational understanding. Hopefully I got you in the mood with this dramatic intro, because today we're going to dive into a world where real life and horror games collide and blend together to compose an experience that's designed to both entertain us as a game and disturb us as a reality. That's why in this video, I'm gonna talk about and go through some of the horror games that have deep stories and dark plots, but many of you didn't even realize that they were based on true events and actual stories from the real world we live in. So buckle up guys, and let's just dive in. This is not really a popular game by any means, and its quality can be debatable too, but that's obviously a discussion for another day, because what's more interesting about it is actually none other than its story and concept. Even though it looks like a normal game where you need to escape from a certain beast, what most players don't realize is that it's actually inspired by actual events and has a real mystery that's still confusing to this day. The Beast of Javadan is not an idea that was invented by the game developer to terrify players. It was actually a notorious creature that terrorized the province of Javadan in the south of France between the years 1764 and 1767, and it was responsible for a series of brutal attacks on humans, primarily targeting vulnerable women and children, which means that he was a douchebag too. The creature was described as a large wolf-like beast with a reddish brown or grayish black coat a wide chest, and a formidable set of fangs. It was even said to possess immense strength and agility and be capable of leaping great distances. Nevertheless, eyewitness accounts varied in their descriptions, with some suggesting it had supernatural characteristics to the extent that some people stated that he was capable of regenerating parts of his body. I know it sounds crazy, but that's actually what locals said at that time. Anyway, the attacks began in the summer of 1764 when a young woman was killed by a mysterious creature while tending her cattle on a normal day in the town. Over the following years, numerous similar incidents occurred, with victims being mauled, torn apart, or completely chopped off. But as I said earlier, the beast exhibited a particular preference for the vulnerable, often preying on women and children in isolated areas that contain fewer movements and crowds. The terror caused by the beast reached such heights that King Louis XV himself took an interest in the case, and a big hunting campaign was launched involving soldiers, local hunters, and even professional wolf experts. But despite their efforts, the creature proved elusive, managing to evade capture and continue its attacks. Various theories emerged about the creature's identity, including supernatural beings, werewolves, rare aggressive wolf species, or even hybrid animals. Some even suggested that the attacks were actually done by multiple creatures and not just by a certain species. Some modern investigators have also stated that it could be a serial killer who used to target specific individuals for unknown reasons and was never caught because he was already one of the locals who pretended to be terrified and were helping in the search. And to be honest, the serial killer speculation sounds the most reasonable, considering how the attacks were tactically executed in many cases. But anyway, it's all theories and none of us can confirm anything, so I'm definitely interested in reading your thoughts in the comments below.
In the end, the only thing I saw was a flash, an insufferable burning light, the pain ripping apart my body. I felt it tearing out of my soul. After a while, I was nobody, nothing. The light went out and I vanished into overwhelming darkness. Colat is an adventure horror game released in 2015 that revolves around a group of hikers who went on a journey to explore the Ural Mountains in Russia. So far, this looks like a normal story and not even that scary. However, the real scary part is the real event that inspired the developers to make this game, which is obviously the Dyatlov Pass incident. This incident refers to a mysterious event that took place in 1959 in the Ural Mountains of Russia and involved the deaths of nine experienced hikers who were part of an expedition led by Igor Dyalov. In late January of that year, the hikers embarked on a trek to reach Mount Atorton. However, they failed to return as scheduled, which raised concerns among their friends and family. Consequently, a search party was organized and several days later, their tent was discovered on the slopes of Kolat Siakl, also known as Dead Mountain. What perplexed the search party was the confusing condition in which the tent was found. It had been torn open from the inside, suggesting a frantic escape, and the hiker's belongings, including warm clothing and footwear, were left behind. Traces in the snow indicated that some hikers had fled barefoot or in socks. As the search continued, the bodies of the hikers were finally found scattered in the area over the following months. Some were located not far from the tent, while others were found at greater distances. Disturbingly, some of the victims were partially undressed despite the freezing temperatures, which means that either someone forced them to undress or they literally went insane and did it willingly. Furthermore, some had suffered severe injuries, including fractures and internal trauma, even though there were no apparent signs of external violence. The subsequent investigation into the Dyatlov Pass incident raised more questions than answers. The exact cause of the hikers' deaths remains a mystery, and the Soviet authorities conducted an official inquiry, which concluded that an unknown compelling force had caused the tragedy. The case was eventually closed, and many of the files were classified. Numerous theories have been proposed to explain the events. Some suggest that an avalanche or sudden weather event was responsible, while others propose animal attacks or military involvement. Even paranormal theories, such as UFO encounters or infrasound, have been put forward and suggested as possible reasons for the tragedy. But if you asked a genius like me, then I think the most reasonable explanation would be human intervention. Even though the recent formal conclusion that was made stated that it was most likely an avalanche, I honestly can't understand how an avalanche can strip people of their clothes and footwear. But anyway, I'm not an expert and I can't debunk any theories from anyone. So if you have any opinion on this mystery, then please don't hesitate to share it with us in the comments. Volterra, 12th March, 1938. Rene T, 16 years old, admitted for observation yesterday morning from Pontedera, accompanied by a police officer authorized by the examining magistrate of the court of Pisa to be admitted for psychiatric evaluation. Medical certificate. Mental illness preceded by warning signs has suffered from depression for a year, believing she had tuberculosis. Food deprivation. The Town of Light is a unique horror game because it simply doesn't rely on traditional horror elements like ghosts or monsters to be effective, but instead relies on pure psychological aspects that can force you to be uncomfortable or actually be sad to witness the story you're going through. The game follows the story of Renee a young woman who returns to visit an abandoned asylum, and as she explores the decaying facility, she unravels her past and the traumatic events that unfolded during her time as a patient at the asylum in the 1940s. The game tackles sensitive topics such as mental health, institutionalization, and the mistreatment of patients in psychiatric institutions. It sheds light on the harsh realities and questionable practices that occurred in mental health facilities of that era, including neglect, abuse, and unethical treatments. But what makes the experience even more disturbing is that the infamous place in the game is actually a real psychiatric hospital that was established in the year 1888 in Italy, specifically in the town of Volterra in the Tuscany region. 
During its operation, the hospital became known for its poor conditions and controversial treatments, reflecting the inadequate understanding and mistreatment of mental health at the time. Reports and accounts from former patients and staff suggest that the hospital was plagued by various problems, including the use of restraints and overcrowded and unsanitary conditions. On top of all that, there was also a lack of personalized care and limited therapeutic interventions. All of this, and I still didn't mention the instances of physical and emotional abuse, as well as the administration of questionable treatments, including electroconvulsive therapy and lobotomies. The hospital's practices were reflective of the prevailing attitudes and approaches to mental health treatment during the early 20th century, which often lacked scientific understanding and empathy towards those with mental illness. To make it clear, this place was simply a prison and a test lab, not actually a hospital by any means. It's also worth noting that most of the 6,000 patients that went there never had a chance to get out, and they literally spent the rest of their lives inside its dark rooms. Even though the building was closed in 1978, its haunting history is still a source of fright and distrust to this day, in a way that makes most people unable to trust mental institutions. And by the way, if you think this kind of place is exclusive to Italy, then you obviously have no idea what was happening in American mental hospitals in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The United States is pretty much the champion when it comes to having the most messed up psychiatric institutions that were used as testing centers for the government and the intelligence agency. So if you're planning to create a horror game someday, then keep in mind that mental hospitals can provide you with enough inspiration to basically surpass your imagination. I was always scared. They told me that they would bring me to a place where the fear would fade away. That is where I stopped living. I've tried to explain what was happening to me. I was tied to my bed for days and days. Abandoned to my nightmares. Silenced only by an injection. My fear was no longer fear. It was madness. Hey man, what are you doing? Hey! Move away from the body now! The fuck is this? Hey, did you hear me? My God. Hey, no, 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 no! This is one of those games that came out of nowhere and then disappeared, and the only people who still remember it are me and three other people from Antarctica. It was first revealed in late 2013, when we were preparing to shift to the era of PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, and I was honestly one of the people who were completely blown away by its concept and plot. Which is not surprising considering how gaming at that time was much better than the mess we are seeing currently. Anyway, the story takes place in Salem, Massachusetts, and is generally about a detective who gets killed by an anonymous serial killer at the beginning, and then he literally turns into a ghost and finds himself forced to search for and unravel the identity of his killer in order to reach an end to his mysterious situation. You're probably wondering now how a ghost searching for his murderer is inspired by real events. Well, it's actually the identity of the murderer that can answer your question, because eventually, when you progress in the game, you'll realize that the killer is a girl called Abigail Williams. And if you're familiar with history, then you can definitely recognize who she is and what she did. But if you don't know, then I'll gladly explain it to you. 
Abigail Williams was a central figure in the Salem Witch Trials, a historic event that occurred in colonial America in 1692 and is still considered one of the most memorable events of Salem's history. And in case you're someone who doesn't know what a witch trial means, it's simply the persecution of people accused of witchcraft and sorcery, but what actually happens is basically the persecution of random people who didn't do anything or people who disagree with the authorities, including political opponents and protesters. Anyway, the real Abigail was born around 1680. She was approximately 11 years old during the trials and lived with her uncle, Reverend Samuel Paris, in Salem Village. The events leading up to the witch trials began when several young girls, including Abigail, began to exhibit strange behavior. They experienced fits and convulsions and claimed to be tormented by unseen spirits and unknown entities. Eventually, these girls accused various individuals in the community of bewitching them. And this accusation led to the subsequent arrests and trials of many people. And by the way, at that time there was something called accusers. These people are one of the main factors that are necessary in order to have a trial and find the suspects. And when it comes to accusing, Abigail was pretty much the queen of accusing and the master of making up allegations. She accused dozens of people of witchcraft, including a woman called Tituba, who was a slave from Barbados who worked in the Paris household, which is the house of Abigail's uncle. But the worst part is that Abigail's accusations and dramatic performances in the courtroom played a significant role in influencing the outcome of the trials, which means that she wasn't only good at accusing people, she was also good at getting them convicted. The motivations behind Abigail's actions remain a subject of speculation to this day. Some theories suggest that she was seeking attention, power, or revenge, while others propose that she genuinely believed in witchcraft and was really frightened by the events around her. But I personally believe it's a mix of both revenge and misery, especially considering the fact that she was an orphan who lost her parents during an attack on their house by locals, and her life with her uncle was basically miserable because he wasn't really happy to have her. However, as the hysteria in the town began to wane, doubts emerged about the validity of the accusations, and in May 1693, the governor of Massachusetts issued a general pardon, resulting in the release of the remaining prisoners. But the scary part is that after the trials, Abigail literally disappeared from historical records. There are no known details about her life following the events in Salem or where she went and lived. It is uncertain what happened to her, as the historical record does not provide any conclusive information, which is crazy when you think about it for a moment. I mean, how the heck can a person who manipulated so many events in history simply vanish with no trace? We're not even talking about something that happened thousands of years ago. It's literally an event that happened a few centuries ago, and yet we don't know more about one of its essential elements. Even though historians can easily tell you what a random person in ancient Egypt was eating for breakfast, and what the color of their underwear was. Anyway, the point is that this girl left and took her secrets with her forever. You made me kill her. Our list for today has officially ended, but I'm sincerely curious to know your opinions on each story and what your theories are about their mysteries. I want to know if you think the beast in France was an actual unidentified species of creature or a serial killer who was just too smart to get caught. Or do you believe that the crew in Colette was actually a victim of an accident or that something more complicated happened that most likely involved humans? And how about the Nightmare Asylum in Italy? Are you among the people who are convinced that mental asylums were in a dismal state everywhere? Or are you among the skeptics who think all of the hype is exaggerated? And last but not least, I'm insanely curious to get some ideas from you about where Abigail Williams went and how she lived the rest of her life after her controversial childhood and impact on her town. But anyway, enough chit chat and I hope to see you soon.